everyone. Welcome to the Black Women's Wellness Podcast. I'm Deja Love. This is a podcast where we amplify Black women's voices as we discuss how we manage stress and maintain well-being. We want to ensure that all Black women live productive, meaningful, and robust lives unhinged by stress. We are excited that you have tuned in to this episode. So sit back, listen, comment, and share this podcast. I am really excited. I say that every episode. In every episode, I am really excited. But this, I'm really excited to have a good friend and and colleague as we talk about this episode, you know, how Black women, we manage stress, wellness, and joy amidst a health scare, a cancer diagnosis, the journey of recovery, and then even how we navigate local politics. And so I'm joined by Lisa D.T. Rice. And she is here with us, and and you'll see you'll hear in the introduction. It's very robust, and that's what Black women are. We are not singular. We are very multifaceted. And today's episode is going to really share that. It's going to share, wow, how is one person managing all of these things? And that's you know, <laughs> black women. Our wellness is infinite. And so, Lisa, I am really happy you're here. It's great to see you as always. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks so much for the invitation. Uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation for sure. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I I want to start off with, and we'll get into more, but as a politically active DC resident and newly locally elected official, you, amongst other intersectional identities that you embody as a wife, as a mother, as a survivor, you know, as a knitter, as many more, how do you maintain your well-being and cope with stress? That's a, that's a really good question. And um, so I'd like to start with, I don't always do it. <laughs> 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 so I don't want to paint myself to be someone who has, you know, reached the magic formula every day, but I certainly um, try to put I, my, I try to make my number one priority my um, physical and mental health. Mm-hmm. And so that means, you know, going to the doctor. That means, you know, reading things that I like. That means watching trashy TV and not feeling an iota of guilt about it. Um, you know, because it's been really stressful. Uh, for most of us since March 2020, um, for me, since the end of December 2019, because that's when I found out about uh, what was coming. Um, I'm fortunate to have friends all over the world, and a lot of my grad school um, classmates and I were on um, WhatsApp and Slack together. And so you know, we, there were, I think, probably two or three people in Italy, one who is in Turkey, and he's a medical doctor, um, and Greece. So there were, and and I have another friend from grad school who uh, was in China. Mm -hmm. And so, and I thought, and I follow someone who used to be a local reporter and uh, then was uh, CNN China Bureau. And um, so I knew what was coming Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, being prepared, what I, and, you know, being prepared was key, I think, um, because I knew that it wouldn't be, you know, uh, something that would be in and out in a season. Mm -hmm. or even a year Mm -hmm. Um, and based on what I understood and knew from the pandemic a hundred years ago this is probably going to be you know before we have things really under control at least a four or five year event my father was born in 1920 which was um, really the height of the Spanish flu pandemic he um, he was the youngest child, and uh, his mother lost two children to the flu. Um, so 
you know, he had two siblings that died before he was born. So I've always been attuned to, you know, things happen like this. I am not a scientist by any stretch of the imagination, but, you know, I, I know history and in, in the family, there were deaths that were attributed. They call it, they called it the influenza and there were deaths, uh, I think going like to 1922, 23. So I knew from my own family's history that when this kind of thing comes along, it's not just a year or two. So, you know, being prepared mm. is key. Yeah. Mm. So tell us, let's backtrack a little bit. So first, congratulations on your new position. Tell us, <laughs> what does that encompass? I remember when you told me that you're like, DJ one. And I'm like, yes, you're in local politics. <laughs> tell us what is the position what does it entail and how has it been going so far since you were elected? <laughs> well, um, so as far as how it's going so far, I'm just, I'm commissioner elect, okay. um, advisory neighborhood commission or commissioner ANC for single member district 7B07. And that's a little tiny slice of Ward 7 representing about. 2000 residents, very hyper local, um, and really a position I did not plan to run for. Because of redistricting, we there's a pocket of us on both sides of Pope Branch Park, and we were going to be unrepresented. And so there were a couple of us, you know, talking about who, you know, who can we draft, and, you know, who, and, and I was like, not me. <laughs> and another friend was like, not me. And so by the filing date, we were both sort of like, oh, we don't have to do it because someone else filed to run. Mm -hmm. And then by the deadline for petitions, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but that person fell off the radar. So we were going into the election with no one running. And so for me to be unrepresented is, it's, it's not acceptable, especially if I'm within that area. And so that's literally how it happened. Um, I made the decision 15 days. I filed 15 days before the election and it was mayhem. <laughs> it was so funny. But, um, you know, I got a network of friends and neighbors and uh, my husband was amazing helping me, you know, make um, we printed out door tags to put on people's doors for door knocking. We made yard signs like a homemade yard. <laughs> it was just crazy. Uh, and so it, the position is really the grassroots neighborhood level um, representative of these 2000 um, to try and get things done that don't happen through the council member's office. Yeah. As a person who did not file, uh, you know, more than 15 days in advance, I, I can't say for sure everything that'll happen. I know the areas uh, focus for me um, are public safety, mm. um, the impact of the increasing car violence that we have, mm. and um, and then what I call sensible development within Ward Seven in the areas that are adjacent to Seven B within and adjacent to Seven B. Um, we have a lot of folks here who are resistant to development and there there has to be some sort of medium we have to continue to develop to develop um you know there's there's a big need for senior housing in ward 7 well really all all, all across the district but you know there 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 are things that could be done that I think if 
if done in a thoughtful way, would be beneficial. So, you know, those are the three things that I am focused on, you know, for this specific area. Um, but, you know, this is my first dipping of the toe into local politics. At my, my forte is national politics. Um, and so I am very, very focused on democracy reform and political innovation. And so we're going to see how those two parts of Lisa <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, I will say, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to irritate some folks because now that now that I've been elected, they're going to hear about nonpartisan primaries. They're going to hear about ranked choice voting because that is what I'm really focused on. Yeah. Um, as far as democracy reform and political innovation. So, you know, uh, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love it. And I just, you know, and I, I can appreciate being newly in this role. How DC politics, and we won't, that's a whole other podcast episode, but it is incredibly convoluted. It's not clear and it's not always understandable. How right. do you think, because your role does speed up to the broader DC council, how do you think you'll use your position and even leverage across to make, to help DC government be a little bit more accessible and understandable? Yeah, so that's such a good question. And I think the first thing that we need to recognize that this convolution, this lack of clarity, this is a feature, not a bug. Hmm. Okay, so this is the way <laughs> It is designed to be. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we can get caught up in, we think that the system is broken. This system is functioning exactly as designed. And what a shame, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that, and that's not just DC. Mm -hmm. That's the entire, that's local government, state governments, national government, you know, it, it's, it's an, it's, it's a pandemic of its own. It's an endemic, but, um, you know, I, what, what I hope to be able to do and always focused on these 2000 residents is to, you know, drive some accountability and in, in those areas that are important to the residents. And honestly, um, someone in the neighborhood asked me, well, what are you going to be your priorities? And I went through those three things. Mm -hmm. And she said, okay, that sounds good. And but then when I was doing door knocking and was talking about the redistricting, I found out from folks that they didn't know the impacts of redistricting. They didn't understand and because we're carved out, it's a crazy little carve out where we are. We literally are in a different SMD than our neighbors ac across the street. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and the people around the corner on one side of the block were in an SMD. So there was a lot of confusion. And I, I've said, and you, you might have read on Twitter, I've never had to deliver so much bad news in one day. You know, I thought it was like going to be, hey, I'm Lisa Rice, I'm Ryan, please write my name in, here it is, I'm going to do what I can. And um, that that first day of door knocking was just like a lot of people uh, just upset. They, they didn't have information, they were talking about different things that happened. So really my takeaway is if I can be successful in communicating to my 2000 residents, what's happening that'll be that's true up a you know that like that'll feel like progress so i am thinking about how how do i make that happen how do i communicate and not over communicate and so um you know as after january 2nd is when um the new year begins for um the ANCs and the council i um may be out of town. So I've already arranged to have my swearing in on January 4th. Um, and so, you know, during the month of January, you know, things will get up and running. I'd like to have a, a small web presence and a, 
a way for people to contact me and and I have to come up with something to be able to follow issues, you know, some kind of database or or something. And then um, my thought is a quarterly newsletter so that um, folks within the SMD have an idea of what's happening. And that will be, I'm sure, SMD. It'll also be Ward 7 and maybe Citywide. I mean, one of the things that I was thinking about, and as you know, my son is a public school teacher in Ward 8. And the fact that this council does not have an education committee is a crime. Mm. So somebody might hear me piping up about that. Mm. <laughs> you know, we need, it's, it's, yeah. So I guess I go back to, you know, this convoluted kind of muddy, it's all by design. Mm. It's all by design. And, and when I try to, I try to think, well, you know, maybe it isn't, you know, I just have to see when uh, Grasso left and Grasso was chair of the education committee and for there not to be, you know, for that committee to be dissolved simply because the chair left the I mean, that's crazy. That's nuts. And every day we see something about DC schools Mm -hmm. um, that that's reprehensible. So, you know, I have a lot. Yeah, you do. <laughs> and we're glad that you're you're in this position to be able to impact change. It's so needed and to hold our elected officials responsible to us getting them in these positions. So I'm so excited and I and I have your number on speed dial. So I <laughs> <laughs> Well, I hope you know, I hope I can make things happen. I don't know. Um We'll see. I mean, the the seven B commission, they're all really great folks. I know um, a couple of them really well, and I know a couple more sort of in passing. And then um, there are one or two that I've never met and don't know. There's someone else that is brand new to the group. Like their their um, SMD was redistricted, and they weren't going to be represented. So there's someone else that did the same thing. So um, you know, it'll It'll be good. It's a good group. It's a really good group and solid, solid folks on it. It's good to hear. Um, really excited for you. Really, really excited. So let's transition a little bit. You know, we've talked about your a little bit and just touched on. We could have a whole other episode about the D.C. political scene and landscape. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's its own episode, which we'll have to bring you back for. But tell us a little bit more about, you know, as Black women, not at all speaking as if we're monolith because we're not. You know, we have many competing priorities. And you talked about how your your family, you know, losing family members to the, uh, you know, in the 1920s in that era. So being prepared that this pandemic is going to be extended. How, you know, with all that you have on your plate, once you received this diagnosis, like how, I mean, how did you, how did that impact just your daily responsibilities, all the other things that you have on your plate? You're an ambitious woman. You you are passionate. There's so much you want to do. How did that shift, um, especially where you are now? How did that shift at that point in time? Are you talking about the cancer diagnosis? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, <laughs> I I was v- very familiar with cancer. I'm actually a third generation cancer survivor. My grandmother had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Unfortunately, it was not diagnosed until it had metastasized to her lungs and other parts of her body. My mother was a two-time breast cancer survivor. At the time of her second diagnosis, she was in sort of late, um, I, I'm not sure how you call the staging of Alzheimer's, but advanced or late stage Alzheimer's. So I had to make all of her medical decisions for her. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I based what I did on what she did for herself um, when she was first diagnosed, which is I was in college. Um, at the time of her first diagnosis. So a lot of years in between. Um, Now, interestingly, 
in 2014, which is the year my mother's diagnosis, her second diagnosis, um, I lost two friends to breast cancer as well. So without getting into all of that, um, by the time I was diagnosed in 2017, I had already been, you know, I managed my mother's disease and, and managed it in a palliative way, um, not necessarily curative because she, you know, she had terminal diagnosis of Alzheimer's. Um, and so I really had already been focused before 2017, I'd been focused on getting more involved with the cancer community. And so I had, by the time I was diagnosed, I'd written two blog pieces for the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship. I was a member of their CPAP, that's the Cancer Policy and Action Team, and I might've gotten that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, advocates, um, I was tra training advocates. I was going on Capitol Hill to um, get people to support legislation that would be benefit uh, cancer survivors. And so I was sort of deep in the cancer world when I got my diagnosis. That doesn't mean it wasn't shocking. <laughs> uh, but it, I will say as someone who... And, by the time my mother was diagnosed the first time, she had had two, and found them herself, two malignant tumors, breast tumors, over the period of, let's see, about six or seven years. So I was very, probably hyper conscientious about my breast health. I had my first mammogram. Um, before I went off to grad school at age 28, 29, um, mm -hmm. because it was driving me crazy. My doctor said, you cannot go away for two years and not have a mammogram, you know? So, but then I started, you know, that was my baseline, in it, but I started regular screening at age 40 and my cancer was spotted by the radiologist. It was not anything I could feel. It was just regular screening. They said to come back and, um, you know, I, I asked, well, what, what did you see? You know, and the first person was like, I don't know. But then I got a chance to talk to the radiologist and she said um, that he spotted something and they want to take a look again. And I said, well, what, what is it? Look, talk to me. Say, I will ask, I'll ask a thousand questions. People it, like kick me out of the room because I just ask questions. But what I learned is that malignancies often have sharper, rougher edges than something that's benign. And so um, she said it, it, it's the rough, he saw, he saw some sharp edges, some rough edges. And so we want to take another look and um, oh my gosh. And it was September, which is, um, you know, and it was the, it was sort of mid September and the radiologist said, we need to bring you back in um, because I, I want to do biopsy and needle guided biopsy and this, that, and all of these other things. And she said, um, and you know, next month is going to be horrendous. October is breast cancer awareness month. And I said, look, you tell me when you've got time and I will be here. Uh, she said, well, you could come tomorrow but you just need to bring a book and be prepared to wait. I said, that's fine. I'll be here. So it's really always been about prioritizing my health, you know, and, and, um, and that's really, that's how my parents really raised me, raised us to, to care for your health. You have to care for yourself. Otherwise you can't care for others. And so, um, you know, I just, uh, and I'm picky. I'm like Goldilocks, Lord have mercy. I, you know, I wanted to get the perfect team for my, for my treatment. And, um, you know, I'm very, very fortunate that, uh, my husband's health insurance is very good. And so I actually interviewed four different teams, oh, wow. uh, before I found, uh, what, 
the the woman that I call my Barbie dream date, my oncologist. Um, but yeah, you know, and she hooked me up with the plastic surgeon who young guy and and the older ladies didn't want to go to him. And I'm like, are you kidding? This is the guy who's recently had his fellowship. And, you know, so, um, yeah, I, I just wanted to do, you know, I want to live and I, I, I feel like, so how, let's see, I was 56 when I was diagnosed. And so, you know, that, that is young (laughs) and the older I get, the younger it is. (laughs) Um, but yeah, that's, that's, I guess that's, that's the short story. How about that? Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that, Lisa. And it, you know, there's so many things that, you know, our healthcare system is incredibly fragmented and you articulated, you interviewed four different people. So it sounds like during this very vulnerable time, you're receiving this cancer diagnosis, Though you're very active on Capitol Hill, legislation, advocacy, you know, like you said, it didn't, it did not make you immune from your own, even your experience caretaking for your mom and the knowledge of, you know, you as a third generation, like this was, you know, you were very aware. How were you able to just navigate this fragmented system? And it sounds like, you know, the, you gave us the, the, the abridged version, but it is not easy. I mean, you say it so, oh yeah, I interviewed four times. Like that, just to find the four different folks is a feat in and of itself. So how were you able with all of these thoughts, you know, you're receiving this diagnosis, you're, how were you able to be very just focused and navigate a very awful system that specifically for Black women does not have our best interests at hand? Right. Yeah, Um. That's that's a good question. So I had I had practice, <laughs> I will say, um, and I'm going to go back to my experience in managing my mother's care. Um, the doctor in my mother, as I said, she was in late stage Alzheimer's and the doctor who was head of the breast cancer program at the hospital where she was being treated uh, recommended chemotherapy, surgery, radiation for her. And I said, absolutely not. That makes zero sense for a woman who is already in a terminal condition. You know, what, what good can come from chemotherapy when the side effects for chemo are horrendous and include you know, sort of, they call it chemo brain, sort of that foggy brain. I said, why would I do that to somebody who is in a state of cloudiness anyway? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, it was, it was really interesting, but yeah, I, um, I'm pretty stubborn. And so I learned a lot when I was managing her care. Uh, and, you know, and this is, you know, this is in the face of someone who is very powerful, you know, and, and he, you know, was trying to convince me, you know, to do all these things. And I said, look, let's talk about the tumor. Let's talk about where the tumor is. And he said, well, we need to get it out because it's against the chest wall and that could lead to necrosis. And necrosis, for those who don't know, is when like the skin, the body actually starts to rot, basically. That is not the medical term for it. So I, and, and it's a very isolating condition because um, of the odor and the look, et cetera. And I said, okay, then what we do is prioritize um, a mastectomy for her. Mm-hmm. And I will not have her, I will not permit her to go through um, chemotherapy or radiation. The mastectomy will take care of getting rid of this tumor. And, um, you know, if if there's any more cancer, then, you know, so be it. But we we need to you know, is really taking a palliative route because my priority was her dignity. It was the end of her life. And so that's, that, that's what I prioritize is her dignity. Um, that her surgeon and I turned out to be great. And he turned out to be a wonderful ally, um, right before her surgery. Um, I met with the 
anesthesiologist and um, this is, you know, she was being prepped and, and then anesthesiologist talked about, um, you know, I'm, I'm there to assure that, you know, everything goes well. And, um, you know, she started talking about, you know, and if, if anything happens, then I'll make sure that, you know, we bring her back. And I was like, no, 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 that, that is not a priority. If she goes during the surgery, let her go. Mm -hmm. And so then the anesthesiologist and I got into this. Um, and so, and so her doctor, you know, her surgeon, the one who I'd been <laughs> with about the treatment was, you know, I said, look, uh, I said, this woman clearly doesn't value quality of life. I said, if my mother goes on that table, you let her go. You do not do heroic things. You do not, you know, try to bring her back. You do, you, you know, you let her go. She's at the end of her life. I want her to go with dignity. So I carried all of that into my experience. Um, not at all worried that um, my diagnosis was terminal, um, you know, just, but I, but I knew that I needed to have somebody I felt comfortable with. Um, and the first team that I interviewed with, um, I, I just felt like I was a number. No, I was like, nope, leaving. Nope. And, uh, the second team that I interviewed with, they didn't seem to be, I don't know, maybe the disinterested, I think is probably the best way to put it. Um, and then the third team, like I said, I'm like Goldilocks. And then the third team, um, recommended by a friend. That's the thing. When you get this diagnosis, don't hold it in. You tell people and you ask them, who do you know? Who do you know? Who do you know? You know, so many women are diagnosed with breast cancer that you can't walk down the street without bumping into somebody that's been diagnosed. And so the third team um, you know, that that particular surgeon worked very well for a good friend of mine. But I, I there was something that was sort of detached about her. And so I asked my friend, I said, you know, she doesn't feel like she's very warm. She goes and my friend said, oh, no, she's not. Not at all. I was like, I can't have that. Yeah. I mean, I think that mechanically she would have been fine. I'm sure she would have been fine. Yeah. And I did ask her. I did ask the surgeon. I said, you know. Um, I'm concerned because it doesn't seem like you express emotion. And she said, well, I do if it's needed. And I'm thinking to myself, but isn't emotion a part of everything? Right. <laughs> and so, you know, I thanked her very much and, you know, went on to find you know, yet another, I asked, I don't know, I asked another doctor, I don't know what, I, I mean, but I, like I said, I finally found my Barbie dream date, and, <laughs> um, and she, you know, was wonderful, and I will say, one of the things that I did, I had um, the pathology reports from my mother's second cancer, and I carried those with me to every single appointment. One of the ways I knew I'd found my Barbie dream date is because she was the only one who asked about that. And I said to all of them, you know, I have, I have the pathology report. Now, all of them knew, but didn't say that, you know, it, there probably was no connection, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, accurate. But what I loved about this doctor and why I decided upon her is because she listened to me. Mm -hmm. She heard everything that I'd been through with my mother, she knew that I cared enough about her health and my health to have those records and to bring them with me. And so she said, let me take a look at that. And so she looked at that, um, looked at the records and looked at the pathology reports for my mom. And she said, you know, this is not a type of cancer that most women her age get. I, I don't think that, you know, there is uh, anything for you to be concerned about. She said, but this is so unusual. I mean, the very fact that she was willing to look at something that had zero to do with me, mm -hmm. but she knew it was important to me. Right. 
And that's why I ended up calling her my Barbie dream date. <laughs> For those those who are from an era that know what Barbie dream date is. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's amazing. That's huge. And, and, yeah. and was there a point when, I mean, to ha- interview four different teams, was there a point when you felt this fierce urgency of like, oh, you're running, you know, you, the radiologist saw something and said, the next day I want you to come back. And so who knows, you know, how long it took you to the course of these four teams, you know, these oncologist schedules are so busy. What was that duration? And did you feel this? Oh, I got to find it. I got it. You know, that pressure. Well, I mean, the thing about cancer is that, you know, it's not, it's not like it's not there last year and it's all of a sudden there this year Mm. it's it's invisible so it's been there and so in my in my mind it was so important that I found the right team and if that meant you know a delay of however many weeks then then I was willing to deal with that um and so you know, I was diagnosed in September of 2017. Um, and I was having some other issues. I was having fibroid issues, which we could do a whole nother podcast on. Um, but I was scheduled for a hysterectomy. Then the, and that was in, no, that was scheduled for November. Then the cancer diagnosis came and then, um, you know, I'm, I'm seeing people, oh, that's a hot, that is how, that's the, that's how I found the fourth team, the Barbie Dream Day. When I went in for my pre-op for the hysterectomy mm-hmm. and speaking with my OBGYN and, oh my God, I, the radiologist's office had not told him that I'd been diagnosed with cancer. So I was like, sort of, I was like, yeah, now with this cancer, I don't know, you know, you know, should we, you know, should we take out the ovaries too? And he's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so, right. so, so very that, inelegant. Treatment? Like if that was um, November, the hysterectomy pre-op and then December you were diagnosed, like how did that? No, occur? no, no. I was diagnosed in September. Oh, September. Excuse me. September. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, so then we had the discussion about, you know, well, it don't just take the uterus, uh, take the tubes, take the ovary, take everything out. Um, because you know, this can- cancer can come through up, push up through the tubes and I'm being very inelegant. I don't, I'm not a scientist, <laughs> it. but, but what I do know, but what I do know is, um, it all turned out to be the right decision when they did the pathology on the fibroids and on the uterus. It had turned out that the condition that I'd had, which was causing all of these problems for years, mm-hmm. was in fact hereditary. Oh. And I talked to one of my aunts about it. She said, and she was talking about her mother, my grandmother, and mm-hmm. how my grandmother, who was a school teacher, you know, had, you know, all of the successive bleeding and 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 really, really hard time. And uh, she said she remembered one time when um you know, other teachers, some other teacher had come into her classroom and like brought a blanket to wrap around her because she had bled through. And, and so I was like, oh my gosh, you know, all of this stuff happening. But when I talked to him about that, I said, yeah, and I'm really having trouble finding Mm -hmm. a good team. And he recommended the the person that I'd already seen from, you know, the third doctor. And I said, yeah, um, I can't deal with her. She, no, <laughs> I, said, I said, she has zero emotion. He said, well, what about so-and-so? And I said, I don't know who she is. And it turned out it was on that. The lady was on a list. The oncologist was on a list that my um, primary care physician had given me. And so, um, you know, I got in to see her and um, sometime in November, it was before my, hysterectomy and oophorectomy and then um and then I had my bilateral mastectomies in January so wow I I just kept moving I mean you know I I wasn't in I wasn't in a rush because I knew that finding the right match Mm -hmm. because this really is somebody that 
you're going to be on a minimum of five year journey with. Mm -hmm. So good point. It, wow. It was, it was worth it to me. And, and, you know, again, lucky that I had uh, the kind of health insurance that allowed me to do that. Right. Right. And you're, when you were sharing with your mom advocating, just again, you had a paradigm shift. It was a very different approach. And I think most people, like you said, no heroic interventions. You were, I want to honor her dignity. And how, how was that informed? Because I think a lot of folks, you know, they want to do whatever they can to save the parent, you know, to just really, and you were, you challenged that notion and said, no, I want to hold space for her dignity. She has this terminal diagnosis and, and, and I don't want this, you know, Disney approach of what we've been told. Yeah, right. how, how was that even informed? I would love to hear more about that. Well, my parents and I, um, and my parents were amazing, amazing advocates for family members at end of life. Um, my um, grandparents um, came here um, and my grandmother, my grandparents actually lived here when my my grandmother was ill and they had friends you know, a friend in particular that I'm thinking of that they, um, you know, were there for her uh, when she was dying. And also one of my mother's uh, youngest sister um, died. Um, I, and it's just, I was, I was raised with the, I mean, it's a philosophy that your life, you live your life as you want to live it. Mm -hmm. You go out of this world as you want to. Mm -hmm. And so my parents and I had all, always talked about what do you want at the end of your life? Mm -hmm. How do you, how do you want that to go? What, what do you want that to be? And brought my son into that conversation when he was young because he and I had moved in with my parents uh, mm -hmm. when my first husband and I separated and divorced. My son and I were here. My mother had um, her diagnosis. So we, you know, her Alzheimer's diagnosis. So we talked about what things are going to be like. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, both of my parents articulated it is quality over quantity. Do not hook me up to some machine. Don't be heroic. Don't have people pounding on my chest. Mm -hmm. um, I want to go out with a good quality of life. I want to go out in a dignified manner. Mm -hmm. I want you to honor my request. And so as as her child, I mean, there was no question for me that um, I would honor what she wanted, which was a peaceful transition. Um, and, you know, she was such a smart, smart woman, very creative. And we actually talked about, you know, what, you know, what happens with Alzheimer's and, you know, and, and she just, you know, she said, it's, you know, it's not, don't like, don't extend mm. the days mm. when the quality isn't there. Mm. And for someone who has Alzheimer's, as they get toward the end of their life, mm. you know, you make them comfortable, mm. but the quality of life isn't what, at least it wasn't what my mother wanted and and I know for myself and I've already told my son I'm like look if that is my end of life scenario you and I are going out in the backyard I'm going to have a handful of pills and you're going to give me a bottle of wine and we're going to have a conversation and mm -hmm. we're going to I said because I'm not you know mm -hmm. I am not going to be someone you know that's hooked up to machines and and so forth but those are conversations that you have to have with your partner with your child with to whomever over the course of a lifetime because 
it, it's too emotional if you get to that point. If I had never had those conversations with my mother, if I didn't know what she wanted, I would never have been able to look that anesthesiologist in the eye and say, absolutely right, not. Right, right, exactly. Not, not going to happen, you know. Um, and and her doctor, as I said, you know, quickly, you know, was by my side on that because he knew by dealing with me throughout her disease that I had her best interest at heart. So he knew, <laughs> you know, he knew that I knew, he knew that she and I had, and he met, you know, I took my husband in for an appointment. I took my son in for an appointment with him. I mean, he'd met the family and, um, and so in that moment, when I was defying the anesthesiologist, a black woman, and I was like, sister, please <laughs> don't fight with me. Right. right. You know, I mean, but, you know, I, it's just, it's prioritizing what that person wants. It's prioritizing. And, and, you know, I mean, I happen to be a person who has that same system of belief. So it's not like it was hard for me. Mm -hmm. um, and my goodness, she's the person that gave me life. Of course, I want to honor that. Right. And I love what you were saying of this, you know, with your son and your husband, you know, for your health, that you, everyone's been brought into this conversation. And I think that's beautiful yeah. from a generational perspective of not... Yeah. You know, sometimes in our families, we don't share health information. We don't share diagnosis. Right. We don't share treatment. And so we're blinded, um, or excuse me, I don't want to use that term. We we are oblivious to our own health history and how that potentially yes. manifests. And it sounds yes. like you and your family, there's been a legacy of clearly communicating, getting everyone yes. on board, children, everyone. Yep. And that, I mean, that's, that's atypical. That's not very common yeah. all the time. well and and um you know and when I was diagnosed um obviously the first person I told was my husband um and he he wasn't there the first like when I went back the first time but you know he was there with me you know through everything else and um you know I told my son and I told my son about the treatment that I'd chosen mm -hmm. um I had cancer in just one breast and the other breast had some abnormal cells and, mm -hmm. and there was some concern. And, you know, I told my son, look, um, and I did have genetic testing. And so we know, and that I will tell you in all of this, the only time I was panicked was between the date of confirming my diagnosis and when I got the results of the genetic testing, because I thought to myself, my God, I hope that I'm not passing this along to my son, right. you know, because men get breast cancer and men are diagnosed far later than women. And it, I, I was literally, that was the panic mm. surrounding my diagnosis. Once I found out that um, there were no genetic abnormalities, um, no mutations, you know, I was like, okay, well, we just deal with this. And I did have a conversation with my son and I said, look, you're an only child. Um, having been through managing mama, that's what we call my mother, mama's care. I said, um, I am going to go ahead and I'm making a decision to have bilateral mastectomies, even though I don't have cancer in the other breast. I said, because I don't want you to have to deal with that. I said, I'm going to be enough of a pain in the ass when I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to deal with that. No, mom, no, mom, you no, don't you do what you need to do for you. And that I said, but that is what I want. Yeah. I said, that is, that is what I want mm -hmm. because I plan to live a long time and I do plan to live long enough to be a royal pain in the ass for you. <laughs> <laughs> I said, so this is easy. <laughs> right, right. I was like, this, this is just easy. <laughs> How was that um, bringing your son into this? And what was his response? And, you know, because when, especially breast cancer, which a lot of families, you know, different from other cancers, because it's the breast, there's this 
taboo. We don't talk about it. It's really hush hush. It's not as just open. You know, how was his response and 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 that? He, you know, he he's a truly empathetic person, mm-hmm. and he just wanted to be there for me. You know, and he was, he was, he was there, you know, um, it literally, he was in the room, you know, you're out in the waiting room and then they bring you back. And, and, you know, once I get dressed into the gown and everything, and he and my husband were in there and, and, um, you know, he met, he met my oncologist, he met my plastic surgeon. Um, and, um, you know, he's, he, you know. He's my legacy and he is amazing. And, and this, you know, this, this little thing that we have of being hush hush about this disease or this thing, that's, that's bullshit. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I am a better person, a better adult, because when I was growing up, my parents exposed me to all facets of life. And I think that I in turn did that for my son. Mm -hmm. Um, And we, you know, we're family and, and not in each other's business in a busybody kind of way. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know what girlfriend he had in high school or blah, 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 you know, not that kind of thing. But when it's important, when it's about your health, again, prioritize your health because you can't, do what you want to do. You can't care for the people who are important to you if your health isn't in order. Right. Yeah. Mm, I love hearing this. This is such an amazing, just legacy story, generational story. I mean, I, it's it just end of life approach and welcoming it as opposed to generally there's a lot of fear associated with it. And hearing that it's it had been normalized in conversations over the years, I think right. it's, it's just but that doesn't cool. mean you're not afraid at the end, and mm-hmm. that doesn't mean that as you know caregiver, um, you know that I, you know I didn't want her to die, but I didn't want her to live a life that wasn't full, right. and. And I wanted her and, and my father as well. Um, you know, my, and we haven't talked about my father at all. And he passed away. My father died six days before I took my son off to college for the beginning of his freshman year of college. Mm-hmm. Um, and my father, you know, make a long story, not a really long story short, but he fell in March of 2011 and that led to a bunch of cascading things and so um he was in um a rehabilitation facility and it was clear that he was going to die um and he wanted to die at home i was like okay Mm. let's do it let's make it happen and brought him back home um so that he spent his last few weeks at home and died in his living room i actually had just moved him out of the bedroom with my mother because he was having, you know, it was he's getting really fitful, and so we got him a hospital bed. And um, actually, the night the the hospital bed came in, we put that in the living room, um, you know, in the morning, and he died about twelve hours later. Um, so, and you know, I he that's how he wanted to die. He wanted to die in this house. This is the house that he built. Mm -hmm. And um, he wanted to die in this house. And I said, uh, you by all means, right, I will, you know, whatever I need to do to make that happen. And, uh, and so he died there. When my mother died, um, we had her wake here at the house, right in this living room. Oh, wow. Yeah. I was like, this is her house too. And she had not been in the house because she'd been in um, assisted living. So she hadn't lived in her home um, for several years. And so we brought her here and um, and had her wake here, mm. right right in this living room. So you're, you're right where it ha- happens. You know how they say be in the room where it happens. So, 
this is the, yeah, my dad died in this living room and my mother's wake was here in this living room. Mm. And just in, in looking at you, I mean, that's a source of, it seems like comfort and pride and healing and just a closure of a full, you know, a full li- life yeah. that was lived. Yeah. yeah, 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 it is, you know, it it is comforting and I've, I'm looking around the living room and I'm not even going to show you, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that, you know, we're getting ready to do decorations for Christmas. So it looks like an explosion has <laughs> happened in here. But yeah, I mean, yeah, this is the room where my father died and, and where we brought my mother for her wake, mm-hmm. which was a very, very cold. It was like bitter cold um, that day. And, um, and, and it was so cold, but it, what it turned into her wake turned into neighbors Mm -hmm. um you know because they could come they could walk over and then my friends I have a solid solid group of women that I went to high school with Mm -hmm. and um and and a couple friends from grade school Mm -hmm. and so you know it wasn't a huge wake it was you know I don't know maybe 20 Mm -hmm. but it was awesome Mm -hmm. it was awesome um, and then, you know, next day was her funeral. Yeah. And you're in the home. That's amazing. I mean, not many people have that. Yeah. That legacy to share. And I, I, that's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing this uh, story and experience. And I would, I know as we're reaching the end as a survivor and as a black woman survivor of cancer, what mm-hmm infuriates you about just the mainstream homogenous representation of cancer and you know October and not always representing black women well what what's infuriating is the health care system writ large Mm. we are not unhealthy Mm-hmm. because we're black. Right, right. We right. are unhealthy because of a system that treats us like shit yes. because we're black. Say Those that. are two different I, things. I love right? that. Lisa, say that again. Just say it. <laughs> <laughs> we are not unhealthy because we are black. We are unhealthy because of a system that treats us like shit because we are black. Yes. And those are two different things. Mm -hmm. And so what I try to do, and, um, you know, I mentioned uh, that I had done some advocacy for the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship, and I joined the board of directors a couple of years ago, and I'm vice chair of the board. And so one of the things that I do is, uh, talk about the discrepancies in the way people are treated based upon their, whether it's their ethnicity, what is, whether it's the color of their skin. And when we talk about breast cancer in particular, you know, people ignore the fact that men have fatty tissue. And that's that fatty tissue, you know, near those nipples, those are breasts. Hey, you know, um, so I, I, um, I try to support, um, you know, it's, it's, there's so, we could have a whole conversation just about that. But what I try to do is remind people that, oh, hello, the mail's coming in. Um, (laughs) Sorry about that. But what I, what I try to do is is remind people that it is not the color of our skin that makes us sick. Mm-hmm. It is the way we are treated by the system. It is the way people have been educated. It's the way medical school teaches people. It's the tradition. Um, it's it's <clears throat> we talk about things, you know, traditions. Um, I, I use this analogy with a friend of mine. Um, you know, we talk about these people that are second and third generation firefighters. Mm. And people say, oh, they were born into it. 
They weren't born knowing how to be firefighters. They sat at the table every day with Mm. firefighters Mm. and the knowledge was built. And so in that same way, the medical system, which has been mistreating black bodies for 400 years, you know, is not like the people who experimented on women's bodies when they were enslaved. It's not like they didn't write that all down and pass it along. There are a lot of things systemically that need to be addressed and unlearned. And, um, you know, it's, it's ongoing, but I, I do ruffle feathers when I say, you know, it, that this isn't a function of my ethnicity. This is not a function of the color of my skin. This is a function of a system that has for centuries used the enslaved as tools, Mm -hmm. as props, Mm -hmm. as, you know, you know, and I'm not even going to get into all the things that were done, you know, to women, um, enslaved women, you know, to advance gynecology, but, um, you know, it's not pretty. Um, but I, you know, I always, when you talk about representation and, and, and I want there to be representation of black women and men in trials and clinical trials, et cetera. But I also want us to talk about this medical system that has devalued and continues to um, mythologize us mm-hmm. because it's that it's that poor knowledge yeah. that that perpetuates the mistreatment. Yes. Yeah. You know, there's not there's not a thing about me. Mm-hmm. There's not a thing about you mm-hmm. that makes you unhealthy that makes me unhealthy that makes me more likely well not me anymore but you know makes a black woman more likely to die in childbirth not it's not a problem with us Mm -hmm. you know it's the system and the way the system treats us because of the way we look right right it has nothing to do with physiology it has nothing to do with biology it has nothing to do with chemistry yeah it has to do with the system yeah and the so why when you say that and it ruffles feathers, it's emblematic of folks not wanting to be confronted with truth. It's still indoctrinated in the pedagogy, nursing school, medical school, physicians Mm -hmm. school, all of those places, this air quote, and I'm saying in quotes, biological inferiority. I still hear that when I'm in conferences. I still hear that from, because it's so, you know, let's just look at textbooks. Textbooks that had representation of black, you know, uh, anatomical figures until recently. Right, right. Yeah, right. this generation, <laughs> right, this generation of med school students are the first, and I bet you it's not every med school across the country, um, but, it, you know, the first to see yeah. um, anatomy. I saw this beautiful drawing mm-hmm. of a pregnant Black woman, mm-hmm. um, and it was, I was like, this is, are you kidding me? This is just now, this is the first time it's appearing in medical class? Yeah, it is. <sighs> so, you know, it's not, it's not for the week. It, no, it and we will continue to ruffle feathers. We, yeah, well, yeah. And, and honestly, so many um, people, black, white, whatever, believe it's in the biology believe it's in the chemistry, believe it's in the physiology, because that's all they've heard. Yeah. Now there are some things that we have been through as a result of, again, the treatment Mm -hmm. thing, you know, and, and I, that is, that's a whole nother episode. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, it is. And we didn't even get into that. So we will definitely have to bring you back for part two, Lisa. (laughs) We can talk about more about that piece of how you receiving a diagnosis navigate, like how your experience contributed to that fragmented system, 
because you had just the complexity. You had a very complex and robust team. You had radiologists, oncologists, plastic surgeon, and many others, you know, and 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 as you know, they don't communicate to each other. So right. they had yeah. to Ooh, it's poor. It's and poor. So, yeah, that's a whole we will definitely have to bring you back because I want to hear about that experience because you're and you're a and you in a very vulnerable position, you couldn't do all the advocacy. You know, maybe it was your partner or someone else serving in that role. You know, and we'll have to talk more about that since we <laughs> into that. There's so much. Um, I I want to hear just as we close. What are the last words that you want to leave our listeners, our audience? Just words of wisdom, or just your your closing thoughts? Yeah, and and I've said it a couple of other times, and I really sincerely believe this. We have to prioritize our health. You have to prioritize your health because we can't do the things we want to do if we're unhealthy. And that is your physical health and that is your mental health. Mm -hmm. Um, At one point um, I was diagnosed and this was decades ago, but um, I was diagnosed um, with anxiety disorder and I was having panic attacks and you know you better believe I went to a doctor and 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 I had a psychopharmacologist that I was working with and um you know did everything that I needed to do to um you know be healthy again um a lot of it was caused by the stress of my separation and divorce And that's another thing that we have to do if we're in relationships that are toxic and bad for us, we have to have the strength to leave. And um, it's not easy. It's not easy. Oh my gosh. The things that were in my head about, oh my God, you're going to be this stereotype. You're, you know, you're going to be, you know, this unwed black mother, blah, 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 you know, all that shit was bouncing around my head. And I was like, Nope, I've got to prioritize my health, my physical health, my mental health. And I also want to raise a healthy child. And I'm not going to raise a healthy child if I'm not healthy or if I'm not prioritizing my health. I mean, we can't help things that happen to us. But if we prioritize ourselves and take care of ourselves, then 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 that's the start, I think. So those are my final words. Take care of yourself. (laughs) We received that, Lisa. Thank you so (laughs) much. This is uh, such a great episode. And where can folks find you? I'm sure as they will listen to this, this, they'll want to know, how can I connect with you and engage with you? Well, I'm on LinkedIn as Lisa DT Rice. And I am on Twitter. And my handle on Twitter is Lisa DT Rice. And I am also on Instagram. Uh, That's my creative space. And uh, I'm a quilter. And so um, on Instagram, now this is going to be a hard one to to say. It's DC Native Quilter. But Native is an N and then the number 8 and then V. So it's DCN8V Quilter. So that's how you find me on Instagram. And right now it's, there's not a creative thing there except for I've been wrapping my gifts, <laughs> but I'm getting ready to get back to the, to the sewing machine because I have to make some gifts. I still have about three, three or four more gifts to make. And so, um, you know, got to get back to it. You'll be busy. Cool thing. Yes. <laughs> Thank you again, Lisa. This was just a wonderful episode. And thank you all for listening to this episode of the Black Women's Wellness Podcast. Continue to check out our upcoming bi-weekly episodes. Subscribe, follow, like, and share this content. Uh, You can find us on our website, the 
www.wwa.com. And we love engaging with our community. So feel free to leave a comment or a message on our social media. We're active on IG at the B-W-W-A-I-N-C. We want to hear what resonates for you with this episode. And until next time, stay well. And remember, our wellness is infinite. Take care.